the worship team. Didn't they do a good job this morning? I ought to give them a good hand. Thanks for, uh, for all that you do, for the time you put in, and the uh, time of worship that you give us. We're uh, still working our way through the Lord's Prayer in this uh, series that we're called Connecting with God. We're discovering the meaning behind the words that the Lord has taught us to pray. We've, uh, so far, we've talked about several different ways that we can connect with God. There was the prayer, actually, of connection. In other words, that time when we actually connect with God in a very good way and find that he is close and consistent. We've uh, talked about the prayer of surrender, the prayer of cleansing, the prayer of dependence, the prayer of release. Now today we want to talk about the prayer of deliverance, the prayer of deliverance. This will be based on Matthew chapter 6 and verse 13, where it says, Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. William Barclay says the word tempt is better translated test. In other words, temptation is a test. It's a test of our strength as a Christian. It's a way of testing our loyalty and our ability to be of service to the Lord Jesus Christ. It's really a test of our character. Now, I've heard people say all kinds of things about trying to change their lives at the very core of their existence, meaning the heart and the spirit. People say, I have made resolutions. I've used self-help tapes. I've even had a hypnosis. I've used yoga. Well, you know, the list just goes on. But they all send us, uh, end up saying, I'm still stuck. I still give in to temptation. I still get discouraged. I still need help. I still fail the test. You see, the truth is, good intentions are never good enough to change your life. If you're going to change your life, it's going to, if you're going to break out of all of those hang-ups from the stuff that is messing up your life, from the past, from temptations, from bad thought patterns, it's going to take more than, I hope I'll do better tomorrow. Or we'll end up in the cycle of good intentions, guilt, and confession. Now, that isn't the way the Lord wants us to live. And that's why we want to talk about the prayer of deliverance. And today we're going to look at that phrase that says, Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Now we often think about uh, temptation as an enticement or a lure to do something really evil, something really wicked, mean, bad, <laughs> nasty, the bad stuff, like drunkenness. Murder, stealing, adultery, fornication. Those are the things that we sometimes think are really forbidden. But actually, as the years have moved along in our life, perhaps we found that Satan is much more subtle in our life. So today I want to make us aware of some things that I think Satan is kind of subtle in his work. The temptation to do what works. Not necessarily the temptation, not to do what's right, but we'll just do what works. The temptation to do what's easy, like when you're a parent, and you set your child in front of the TV set and let the TV set babysit all day. The temptation to do what's quick. The temptation to do what works in the short run. The temptation to do what's best for me you know, kind of self-serving idea. How about the temptation to do what I've always done? Never branching out, never trying anything new. There's also the temptation to do absolutely nothing when you know there's something that you need to do to help. When you see the poor, the needy, the sick, sometimes we're tempted to do nothing. Sometimes we're when we need to love and not hate, there's a temptation. Now, the power of temptation seems to increase if there's any kind of crisis in life or if we're under stress in our life. Some people resort to overeating 
to cope with what they're going through. Others resort to drinking alcohol and drugs. Others tend to sleep more. One person said that many people try to find comfort in video games, always on a video game. Of course, there's uh, gambling. There's drawing into a shell. So we really do need help from God's word. So Jesus said the prayer of deliverance is the path of escape. It is the path to deliverance. That's why we pray, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. It reminds us that temptation is a choice. We can either do wrong or by the power of the resurrected Christ, we can choose to do good. We can choose to do the right thing. When we say temptation was just too strong, the test was too big, I had to give in, I just couldn't help myself, that's just not the truth. But Christ offers us a way out. He offers us a way out. How does the path to escape work? Where do I begin? Well, first of all, if we're going to pray the prayer of deliverance, we must remember three observations about temptation. I like these observations. Anytime that I talk about temptation, I like to use these observations. First, remember that temptation is normal. It's normal. It's neutral. It's natural. Most of us are afraid to think about temptation like that. We just kind of assume if we're a Christian and we're following God's will that we shouldn't have any thoughts, we shouldn't have any feelings. We shouldn't act in certain ways. But look what it says in 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 13. Every temptation that comes your way is the kind that normally comes to people, but God keeps his promise and he will not only allow he will not allow you to be tempted beyond your power to resist. At the time you are tempted, he will give you the strength to endure it and so provide you with a way out. Now you really ought to circle those words. Every temptation that comes your way normally comes to all people. In other words, temptation is normal. It's natural. You see, the devil tries to tell you that you're the only one that's struggling with temptation. By that evil thought, you think that something must be wrong with you. No, it's normal to everyone. Jesus had those thoughts or he wouldn't have been tempted. Yet he was tempted without sin. Temptation is normal. Temptation is natural. Joseph was tempted by Potiphar's wife. In other words, he had all those thoughts at that moment. But he said no. Temptation is, secondly, common or neutral. Common or neutral. Look at Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 15. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet without sin. Circle tempted in every way and no sin. Temptation is neither sin nor bad. Temptation is an attraction. Temptation is a test. Down through the years, many Christians have actually been robbed of living the victorious Christian life because they thought that even the slightest evil thought passing through their mind was absolutely proof that there was still evil in their life. But temptation only becomes sin when in your heart you yield to take action on the thought that you have. Temptation in and of itself is neutral. 
It is simply offering you an alternative. For example, there's nothing wrong with eating food. It's only if you decided to steal the food that you're going to eat. The thought of sin was not sin. It was the decision of the heart, the decision of the will, to do it if I get a chance. That's what makes it sin. Don't be defeated by the thought. It's neutral. It's common. Temptation, like, say it like this. Temptation says, will you? Sin says, I will. Thirdly, temptation is necessary. It improves our life. Temptation can actually improve our life. Look at what it says in James chapter 1 and verses 2 through 4. Consider it pure joy now, my brothers, whenever you face trials of many kinds because you know that the testing of your faith develops perseverance. In other words, develops uh, maturity, completeness, in other words, every time you overcome temptation, every time you learn how to handle it, you actually become a stronger Christian. You have more determination to stay on the right path in the Christian life. It is what builds Christ's likeness into our life. And we're able to say with the Lord in 1 John, not John, but 1 John chapter 4 and verse 4. Greater is he who is in me than he who is in the world. Secondly, in the prayer of deliverance, we want to look at the way out of temptation. The way out of temptation. The first step towards deliverance is to identify my vulnerability. Notice I didn't say to identify what tempts me, but, the other, but rather what causes me to be tempted. What makes me vulnerable in temptation? We need to know the when, the why, the how, the where of temptation. Jesus said it like this in Matthew chapter 26, verse 41. Watch and pray. Interesting words, aren't they? Watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the body is weak. In other words, you may be willing. You may want to overcome temptation. But willpower is never enough. I think we've learned that, haven't we? Willpower will work for a while. But after a while, you get tired, and it burns out. And so there's no lasting change that comes into our life. What is Jesus saying that you need to watch for? You need to watch for the circumstances that make you vulnerable in temptation. So here are some questions that maybe we need to ask ourselves. First, when am I most tempted? When? What day of the week am I most tempted? Am I most tempted on Monday, Friday, Sunday? Perhaps a, a certain time of the day that I'm most tempted? We need to figure out when we are most tempted. Secondly, you need to ask, where am I most tempted? Am I most tempted when I am at work? Am I tempted when I am with in, in certain people's homes? Am I more tempted at the sports bar? When am I most tempted to do something wrong? Thirdly, who's with me when I'm tempted? Who's with me? Am I most tempted when I'm alone? Am I most tempted when I'm with friends that want to lead me in the wrong direction? Remember the old saying, you can't soar with the eagles if you're running with the turkeys. So 
Am I tempted when I'm with certain friends that want to lead me in the wrong direction? Am I most tempted when I'm with my co-workers? You see, we need to identify what makes us vulnerable. Number four, what temporary benefit do I get if I give in to temptation? Remember what the Bible said? Sin has a pleasure for a season, for a season, but it doesn't last. There's always a kickback when it comes to sin. But I need to know what the temporary pleasure is if I give in to sin. Do I get comfort? Do I get excitement? Do I get a sense of false confidence? You see, we need to know what the payoff is. The fifth thing you need to ask is, how do I feel right before I'm tempted? We need to know what our emotional triggers are when it comes to yielding or not yielding to sin. Do you feel frustrated? Is it stress when you're most tempted? Do you feel bored when you are most tempted? How about lonely? Do you feel lonely when you are most tempted? Loneliness is uh, maybe one of the greatest factors in thinking about yielding to temptation. These are the things you need to know if you want to win over temptation. The second step to pray the prayer of deliverance, I need to refuse to let fear overcome me. Refuse to be intimidated by the devil. In other words, he wants to make you timid. He wants to make you fearful. The devil likes to browbeat so he can, uh, so that we don't feel good about ourselves. Usually there are three things that happen when we are tempted. One, we're alarmed that it has ever happened. We say, how could such a thing happen to me? I thought I was a Christian. You see, if he can get us alarmed, if he can somehow shaken us, then we're weakened in our resistance against temptation. Remember, you can reject the thought, but you can't keep the thoughts from coming to your mind. Another reaction is frustration, frustration. Why does the Lord allow this to happen to me? And of course, another reaction is discouragement. Perhaps you watch someone that's going through a real difficult time and the devil plants a thought like, you know, if that were me, I don't think I could handle it. I think I'd fall. The devil likes to plant thoughts like that. Or how about the thought, why does the same temptation come to me again and again and again? It's about to wear me out. You see, the devil wants to intimidate you. He wants to bring fear into your life. Here's what it says in Ephesians chapter 6, and verses 10 and 11. Be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. Paul says the way to keep from being intimidated is to declare war. Put on Christ. Put on his power. Take your stand against the devil's schemes. Realize that he's trying what he's trying to do in your life. Don't feel bad when you're tempted. Christ was tempted too. Temptation is a part of life. Step three in praying the prayer of deliverance, quickly turn to God. Quickly turn to God when you're tempted. 
Look at Psalm 50 and verse 15. Call to me when trouble comes. I will save you, and you will praise me. Someone has said that this is kind of like a microwave prayer. In other words, your prayer is help me. Help me now. <laughs> kind of a mayday, mayday. This would have been the prayer of Daniel, I think, when he was thrown into the lion's den. I don't think Daniel just sat down and leaned up against the wall and folded his hands and said, Now, Lord, I, I wonder how you want me to pray about this. I think he said, Lord, help me. My back's against the wall. It's May Day. I need your help right now. I think that's how he prayed. I think it was the prayer of Joseph. When Potiphar's wife got a hold of his coat. And I think it was a microwave prayer because he had to pray on the run. You see, there are all kinds of times to pray. When you're, time, when you're tempted to get angry with someone, it's time to pray. When you're about ready to make a sarcastic remark to your boss, it's time to pray. When someone has disappointed you, it's time to pray. When life has been unfair to you, it's time to pray. It's time to request God's help. Hebrews chapter 4, verses 15 and 16 says this, talking about Jesus. He had the same temptations we do, you notice that? The same temptations we do. He never once gave way to them and sinned. So let us come boldly to God and find grace to help us in our times of need. Let me ask you a couple questions. Do you think that Jesus ever struggled with anger? Do you, do you think he had a, a thought to get angry? Well, he must have. It says he was tempted just like we are. Have you ever been tempted to get angry? Did uh, Jesus have temptations about sex? I think he did, but he didn't sin. That's why we can go to him. Come boldly to the one who knows how to help and has the grace to help you. Fourthly, to pray the prayer of deliverance, intentionally refocus your mind. Refocus your mind. James chapter 1 and verses 14 and 15 says, Temptation is the pull of your own evil thoughts, thoughts of temptation and wishes. These evil thoughts lead to evil actions. I think the important thing for us to see here is that the battle in temptation always begins in the mind. The way you think determines the way you feel and eventually determines the way that you act. Whatever gets your attention, whatever gives your attention, will, of course, get you. So refocus your attention. Work on something else. You always move in the direction of what you're focused on. For example, if you're dieting and you're always telling yourself, I'm hungry, I'm hungry, you're thinking about food, <laughs> you'll eventually move in that direction. We can't conquer habits by fighting them. We must change our focus, replace the thought with another one, and move on. When Jesus was tempted out there in the desert, he didn't give in. He said, Satan, get behind me. Get out of my life. But do you remember that he refocused on Scripture? He always went back to Scripture. Someone has said, when temptation calls, 
don't answer the phone. Here's a verse you ought to write down. It's not on your worksheet. Proverbs 4 and verse 23. Proverbs 4 and verse 23. Be careful how you think. Your life will be shaped by your thoughts. Interesting, isn't it? Your life will be shaped by your thoughts. Wow. You can't control the circumstances, but you can control your focus. If you don't like what's on TV, you could change the channel. Refocus. Number five, we talk about a lot. To pray the prayer of deliverance, enlist a partner. Reveal your struggle to a friend. Now when I say this, I'll give you a little advice. Don't tell everyone. Just tell someone that you know really good. You don't even have to share everything. You can just share, I'm struggling with this part of my life. Because that's what begins to bring healing into your life. That scripture, Ecclesiastes chapter 5 and verses 9 and 10. Two are better than one because together, if one falls down, the other can help him up. But if someone is alone and falls, there is no one to help him. It's back to the idea that it does help if we can be honest with someone. We have a misconception if we think, I can't, I can't talk about it. In our Friday night group, recovery group, we talk about it. They're pretty honest. And it brings healing. Too many people wear a mask and hide their hurts and their struggles. And when we do that, it has a tendency to intensify the temptation. Maybe you have struggled for years, but you have not told anyone. Did you know that the pressure of temptations and struggles can be relieved by just telling someone? James chapter 5 and verse 16. Here's what it says. Admit your faults to one another. I'm going to stop there. Because the church I grew up in, nobody said anything. We wouldn't have dared to admit our faults. We would have been judged if we admitted our faults. And a long time ago, I come across this scripture. Admit your faults to one another. It makes you wonder sometimes, doesn't it, what church is about? Put on our Sunday clothes our Sunday smile, come into church just in time. You need to be in small groups if you're going to admit your faults to someone. Table talk group, a recovery group. But the church is here to bring healing. Do you remember that Jesus said he didn't come to condemn. He came to save. He came to save. But a lot of time we a lot of times we reverse that. There are people that don't come to church because they think the church is here to condemn. When in reality we're here to save. We're here to lift. It's hard to admit your faults. 
early in my uh, pastorate, I traveled 40 miles to sit down with another pastor that I trusted to tell him about my struggle. You know what I found? Love, acceptance, and help. That's why the church is here. Admit your faults to one another. Pray for each other so that you may be healed. Healing begins at the point of sharing, and since the devil knows that, he wants to think, wants you to think that you're the only one that has that problem. He doesn't want you to tell anyone about it. He doesn't want anyone else praying for you. And it might be that several people are struggling with the same thing you are. Well, that ought to be healing right there, just to know that you're not alone. Don't repress it. Confess it to someone. Sharing your feelings can be the beginning of healing in your life. Well, number six, to pray the prayer of deliverance, turn from the devil. Turn from the devil. This is really the meaning of those words that say, deliver us from evil. Ephesians 6, not 5, Ephesians 6 and verse 17 says, Accept salvation from God to be your helmet and receive the word of God to use as a sword. Turn from the devil, turn to Christ. Three thoughts. Invite Christ into your life. If you haven't done that, invite Christ into your life. Repent of your sin. Repentance doesn't just mean, I'm sorry, Repentance means with the help of God, I'm going to turn from what I've been doing wrong. And then trust Christ as your Savior. Trust him as your complete Savior. Secondly, be filled with the Holy Spirit. Give every area of your life to God. It's the only protection we have, really, from the devil. You remember what it says in Ephesians 5 and 18? Not on your worksheet. Be not drunk with wine. I guess that'd be sin. But be filled with the Holy Spirit. Be filled with the Holy Spirit. Thirdly, internalize God's word. Take time to memorize, and put God's word into practice. You'll need his word in your mind when you go to work or when you go to a social function where who knows what goes on. I was just 22. A friend of mine worked for a company. They had a Christmas party. My young friend had just found Christ also. We had to say no to some things at the Christmas party. It wasn't very Christian. my knowledge, we were the only two that didn't participate. They all said they were Christian. You'll need to take the word of God with you at work, social life, in your social life. Jesus had said by some Bible scholars that resisted temptation because of three things. They may already be written down, I'm not sure, on your worksheet. But you ought to take it with you. Number one, he was filled with the Holy Spirit. 
Number two, he said an instant no. I've always gotten in trouble when I didn't say an instant no. Jesus said an instant no. And he always quoted scripture. He always quoted scripture. That formula will work for you. You can handle temptation. Always remember our deliverance is in Christ. We have a strong defense against temptation. In the continual presence of Jesus Christ in our life. That's the key. That's the key. William Barclay wrote those words. I'm just giving them to you. I think they're good words. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we all face temptations. Undoubtedly, People face temptation on their way to church. There'll be temptation as we leave and go home. In our world today, with the change in culture, when the Word of God is being bent to include the sins that we shouldn't be including, We need your strength more than ever. Help us to put on the armor of God. Help us to stay close to Christ. Help us to say an instant no. Fill our minds with the scripture. When you died on the cross, you paid for our sins. When you was raised from the grave, you gave us power to live a good Christian life. May we apply it to our life today. And we pray in Jesus' name, amen.